I'd like for you to just think in a moment in your mind here to fill in the blank. God is... Just think in your mind. Fill in the blank. God is... What? Now the scriptures say many things about who God is. And so perhaps your mind went to the fact that God is love. We see that in 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. John repeats that later on in verse 16 as well. Or perhaps your mind went to the fact that God is good. Psalm 100, verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Or perhaps your mind went to the fact that God is merciful and gracious. Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And there's so much more that we could say about the nature of God, who is God, how would we describe who he is? First John helps us to think even more about who God is as well. We're going to be looking at verses, First John 1, 5 through 10. And so I want us to look at it from, from two points or two angles. The first is the purity of God. And secondly, the purity of God's people. First, the purity of God. First John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So here's John speaking, saying this is a message that we heard from him, who I believe he's referring to Jesus, during his earthly ministry as he walked on this earth, that Jesus told his disciples that God is light. Absolute purity. Of, of moral excellence. That there isn't even an, an ounce or, or shred of, of darkness or evil or wickedness or sin in God. He's perfect. See this in James, James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Father of lights. With whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And that ending part there speaks about the immut immutability of God. That is, God does not change or mutate. He remains the same, always. He's not dependent on anyone or anything. And so that means that nothing can cause God to, to fluctuate. God doesn't decrease 
in any, in any, in any, in any aspect, <laughs> and God doesn't increase in any aspect. So just think about that for a second. <laughs> that means his love will never be diminished. And at the same time, his love will never increase. He's perfect. And then Jesus, while he was walking on this earth, John 8, verse 12, we read, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus says that he's the light of the world. And what's so, what's so amazing and profound, what we, what we read through, especially John's account of the gospel, we see this, this light and darkness contrast. Light and darkness contrast. That God is pure and perfect and holy and light, and mankind, humanity, is sinful and wicked and depraved and vile and evil. So John highlights this for us. And I think it's helpful for us to, so you know, when we, when we think about God, there are probably many different things that, that come to our mind. But theologians have, have coined the phrase, the simplicity of God. The simplicity of God. Now, this does not mean that God is simple or simplistic, or that he's just like very easy to understand or comprehend. We know that there's a depth to who God is and a depth to his word. But when theologians speak about the simplicity of God, they are referring to the fact that God is without parts. You say, what? <laughs> what does that even mean? Well, think of it this way. At times we might think of God as it relates to his attributes, who he is. We, we think of it in, 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 in terms of pieces of a pie. Don't get too hungry now that we think that God is 10% holy and we think that God is then like 25% love and we think that God is then 20% good and like another 20% just. But that's actually not how the Bible speaks about the very nature and character of God. In fact, we just saw, right, God is light. God is love. God is good. God is just. God is faithful. This is who God is. And so one of the things that helps us not to do is to take God's attributes and kind of oppose them against one another. As if, as if God's love is up here and it's much greater, but his holiness is like down here. Or God's justice is really up here, but his goodness is kind of like down here. No, God is all those things. It's the simplicity of God. And so think about this. this. This then helps us in our lives. <laughs> I mean, think of one aspect, just as, as an aside here. Think about it in relationship to suffering. Some of you have suffered recently. Some of you are, are going through suffering right now. And we can't comprehend the fact that God is good in the midst of suffering. Perhaps in our minds, we might think that God cannot be good or his goodness has been diminished because I'm going through this suffering. But God is always good. He's always light. 
He's always love. That never changes because it's in his nature. And so this means that God's love is a holy and pure love. God only loves what is good. The psalmist tells us, you are good and you do good. And so God is, God is pure and perfect, and this is something we see throughout the scriptures. Over and over and over and over again. Isaiah 6 Isaiah has this vision some of you might be familiar with. And we got these angelic creatures. And what are they doing? Verse 3, Isaiah 6, 3. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. the thrice holy God, the angelic creatures are calling out and worshiping him. And guess who else is there? Isaiah. And what's Isaiah's response? Verse four, and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. I mean, we can't even we can't even fathom or picture this reality. Verse five, and I said, this is Isaiah speaking, woe is me. In response to the holiness of God, Isaiah says, woe is me. Why? For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah as he beheld the holiness and purity of his God, recognized his depravity, his sinful nature. He couldn't even stand in his presence. You see a similar picture at the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. Isn't this very different from how we view angelic creatures with their little diapers and their bow and arrow? Six wings full of eyes all around and within and day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The angels are beholding our holy God right now. We can't even fathom that. And even later in verse 10, when the 24 elders see this, what they do, they fall down. <laughs> they can't even stand in the presence of the holy, pure, perfect God. Many times we belittle our own sin. Even our own sin causes us to diminish the absolute purity of God. I 
We sometimes have a mindset, my sin is not that bad. Or at least I'm not like this person. Or I haven't done this. All of us have unclean lips before a holy God. I'll give you two stories from the Bible that display the holiness of God. There are, there are many more. <laughs> One story is after David and his men defeated the Philistines who were the enemies of God. They wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant was, was holy. This is what dwelt in the tabernacle, the place where God himself dwelt. It contained things like the Ten Commandments and, and Aaron's staff and a, and a golden jar and it had very specific instructions. You ever read through the Old Testament and wonder why, why is there kind of like all these details for the, the temple and all the things they had to wear and all these things? It's because God is holy. He's so perfect. He demands that. He demands that holiness and that perfection. And so 2 Samuel 6, verse 5, and David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. We might hear those words, we might read that passage, and for a long time, I'm like, why? It doesn't seem as if it's that big of a deal. The oxen just stumbled. Uzu was just trying to hold the ark so it doesn't fall. Well, it's interesting. The text doesn't say that the, the ark was going to fall. In fact, they did this whole thing wrong. They didn't follow the instructions that God had prescribed in his word to carry the ark properly. And God struck him down. David was angry because of this. And so we might think, like, isn't this, isn't this a bit harsh? No, it's not harsh. Why? Because, again, God is perfect. God is holy. God is absolute purity. He is light. There is not an ounce, there is no darkness in God whatsoever. Another story. There's a man by the name of Korah. And Korah and a bunch of men came up to Moses and Aaron. And they said, you've gone too far. You have exalted yourself above the other people. It is unfair. Moses and Aaron are just like, what's going on? In fact, we're going to see who God has chosen. And the reason why they point that out, I think, is because the fact that God chose Moses and Aaron. It wasn't as if Moses was anything special. I mean, go back to Exodus 3 and 4, and you'll see Moses is like, God, you know, I can't speak that well. Can't you, like, send somebody else? 
There's nothing special in Moses. God chose Moses and Aaron. And what happened? Numbers 16, verse 31. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. God does not turn a blind eye to sin. We might hear this story and say, I mean, all they were doing was saying like Moses and Aaron shouldn't be exalting themselves above the other people. Is God overreacting? God never overreacts. We overreact. God never overreacts. And so why, why, why would God do this? How could God do this? Because although Korah and the people were actually sinning against Moses and Aaron, their sin and all sin is against God. All sin. God cannot dwell in the presence of sin. And so in Psalm 5, we read this, verse 4, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. God is too pure to be in the presence of sin and evil and wickedness. And even our our standard of sin, our standard of wickedness, our standard of evil is distorted. If I were to ask you to name several sins for me, I'm sure you could do that. Probably there are many that come to mind. But there are other sins that are sins in the scripture that perhaps we may not even think about or we tend to belittle or we think they're not really that big of a deal or perhaps they're not even sinful. In Romans, the apostle Paul tells us to to cast out the works of darkness, cast them off, take them off, put them to death. And he he then lists a bunch of sins And guess what's on that list? Quarreling. Grumbling. Complaining. When you think about quarreling, when you think about grumbling, when you think about complaining, does it make it into the list of what is darkness? But that's in there. And you could read through, as we went through the the wilderness series not that long ago, and the people of Israel, the people of God were grumbling against God. What did he often do? His holiness was expressed. 
He punished them, and oftentimes some of them were killed because of their grumbling. And so why is it that mankind, why is it that humanity sins? Well, we have a a sinful nature. God is good. His nature is good and perfect. We are born with a sinful, wicked nature. And there's another aspect of this that John tells us in John 3, 19 through 20. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. The reason why there is sin and evil and wickedness in this world, the reason why people do sinful and wicked things, the reason why you and I do sinful and wicked things is because we love the darkness rather than the light. And as John points out here, we hate the light. Why? Because when you come to the light, your deeds, your your darkness is exposed. It hurts. Sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night, all the lights are off. I'm probably very weird and strange. I try not to open my eyes. I barely open them. Like I really squint. Why? I don't want any light coming into my eyes. Because it's like, ah! And then even greater is when we come into the light, our hearts are exposed. And this is often seen in the context of relationships. Spouses, parents, children, friends, I never realized how selfish I was until I got married. Why? Because now I'm in a relationship with my wife and my heart is exposed. I see how I want things done my way. I thought I was selfless and that's pride it's arrogance and God hates that and so what is due for mankind who loves darkness what's their end Matthew helps us with this Matthew 8 11 and 12, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 22, verse 13, this is the parable of the wedding feast. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Or Matthew 25, parable of the tenants, verse 30, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those who live in darkness, who walk in darkness, who love darkness, their end is outer darkness. It's the wrath and punishment of God for all of eternity. Because that's what they love. They love darkness, and that is what they're going to get. And so if you are apart from Christ, that is your end. Outer darkness. But 
but the God who is light actually came into the darkness. The God who was pure and perfect and holy and righteous and just, he entered into the darkness. He came into a sinful and wicked and evil and dark world and guess what? He was unstained by it. There was no shred of darkness in him whatsoever. He spent time with sinners. He touched sinners and healed them. And he himself did not become sinful. John tells us this, John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Because it was too pure, too bright. The light came into the world. Darkness has not overcome it. And guess what? The light of the world was put up on a cross. And what happened from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. while the Son of God, the light of the world, was hanging up on that cross, what happened? Darkness came over the land. Scriptures tell us that the sun failed to give light. When has the sun ever failed to give light? Darkness over the whole land, the sun failed to give light, and the Son of God bore the darkness of the wrath of God. Why? So that we, by faith, might be rescued out of the domain of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light where we are now, by faith, the light of the world. Three days later, he defeated that darkness. He defeated death and rose triumphantly over the grave. And so you, by faith, are now light. You're no longer in the realm of darkness and depravity, You're now in the realm of light. And Paul sums this up for us well. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5 and 6. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, right? Think of creation. He spoke God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that was all verse five. And that was just the first point. So briefly, the purity of God's people. John's concern here then is in light of who God is, that we are to actually also walk in light. And he's concerned, I think, about hypocrisy. Look at verse six. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse eight. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John's concern then is on those who profess to know Christ and yet are walking contrary to it. This is different, I think, in regards to struggling with sin. If you are striving after holiness, if you are pursuing the Lord, and you're battling sin and sin and putting it to death by the power of the Spirit, that is different than a rebellious, cold-hearted, walking, running, diving into sin. Verse seven, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Our sin can disrupt our, our, our fellowship with God and with brothers and sisters in Christ. And so John has encouraged us to, to walk in the light. 
Why? As he, as God, as Jesus is in the light. And the promise is, the blood of Jesus' son cleanses us from all sin. Only Jesus' blood can cleanse you from all your sin. Not your good works, not your good deeds, not even the waters of baptism can cleanse you from sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone cleanses you from all your sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession should be a, a daily and multiple times throughout the day for the Christian, that we should often be confessing our sins. We, we say to God, God, I, and you fill in the blank. I was proud or I was arrogant or I was impatient or whatever else it is. You confess those things to God. And guess what? God is faithful and just. He has forgiven your sin in Christ. And that's good news. He's cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And think about how merciful is God that although we had loved walking in darkness, he forgives all of our sins if we confess them to him. He forgives them. And so what's going to help us with this? Verse 10, John says that his word is not in us, right? He's saying this fact that we're lying if we think that we haven't sinned. We've deceived ourselves. And so think about the flip, the flip side of this. We should have God's word in us. Psalm 119, 105 says, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And earlier in Psalm 119, David says what? Your word, or I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so it's God's word being stored up in the heart of the Christian, memorizing scripture pertinent to your struggles, and using God's word to meditate, renew your mind, renew your thinking, so that you walk in the light and not in the darkness. And thank God we have one another to help us with that. That we don't have to be ashamed to share with our, our brothers and sisters, but we can talk with one another. Why? Because our shame has already been taken care of at the cross. And we could come to one another to help us with that. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we do give you thanks. Lord, that you are faithful and good be pure and perfect. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. You would help us to be a people that regularly confesses our sins before you. That we'd be a people who commit ourselves to having your word stored up in our hearts. That we would be pondering you throughout the day. Lord, would you please give us the grace to do so? We need you desperately. Help us, Lord, to encourage one another in Christ, to rebuke, to correct. And I pray, Lord, that your word would be central in our lives. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.